My grandmother started my first conversation about anal sex when I was 13 and she was sitting on the toilet. She hadn't made it seem like the most erotic experience as she scrunched the toilet paper in her hand. And she was a pretty good expert on this. I mean, she worked in a brothel for 10 years and not as an accountant. <laughs> on the other hand, my mother found kissing with your mouth open disgusting and wouldn't let a man touch her unless he first went through the demeaning ritual of dancing drunkenly on a tabletop in her red silk nightie. <laughs> Considering these role models, it's probably not a surprise that anal sex didn't really interest me. <laughs> I mean, the kids on the playground didn't really romanticise it. As we sat on the monkey bars, my friends considered root jobs, not anal bleaching. If being called a poo head was anything to go by, then being pooey was not a desirable state of being. <laughs> being anal sex is, you know, category of porn, nothing much else. <laughs> I, for three years, was in a relationship with someone who I had had sex with for the first time. Uh, the first person I'd ever had sex with. And maybe because of the romantic myths surrounding losing your virginity, I kind of felt like I'd already shared the most intimate experience I could. I mean, you know, awkwardly prodding around a vagina while Meryl Streep sings the winner takes it all from the TV in the other room, really doesn't compare to anything else. You know, taking a walk around the back of the service entrance just seemed unnecessary after that. <laughs> But as I got older and I started connecting with new people, I started to understand how anal sex could almost be a second virginity. I mean, it was something that the men around me idealised anyway. My friend Eddie's girlfriend had this big whiteboard in her kitchen where she wrote down all her hopes and dreams and Eddie would sneak into it and let Eddie do me in the butt. <laughs> anal sex is something I was realising wasn't well, just a big step in your sex life, but it could be a big step in your relationship too. A way to say that no part of you is not desirable to me, that I want to know every piece of you. It was something I had left to give. It wasn't something that everyone explored or shared. It was this ultimate conquest, something I had left. And... <laughs> by now. <laughs> but yeah, so it was something I was thinking about a lot and I started making a connection with someone else. You know, not necessarily Mr. Right, but Mr. Writer. Someone who was safe but exciting. You know, good in bed, but not so well hung that we'd be trying to make a sausage sandwich with a leg of ham. <laughs> and so I made the decision to at least think about it. I started researching like the conscientious student I am, and here I'm doing my PhD, I have that approach to all aspects of life. <laughs> so I was waiting, perhaps poetically, for my flight from Phuket to Bangkok. <laughs> I was inspired. And for some reason, the Wi-Fi didn't block porn sites in the airport like it did in the rest of Thailand. It was a very frustrating couple of weeks. <laughs> So, you know, I'd been eating ice cream because I really didn't expect the internet to work. And, you know, patriotically it was a tub of Milo ice cream. And so I'm searching terms like well-made, female-friendly, educational anal porn that Jermaine Greer might in some lifetime approval. <laughs> so I found my stuff and I've got my earphones in really quietly, some extra sneaky, you know, like um, if someone in the movie goes underwater, so you hold your own breath. Or if someone else on the other end of the phone is someplace quiet, you know, hi Maggie, I'm sorry, you're a library. So you whisper over the phone and you're in the middle of traffic and then she can't hear you. So yeah, so I'm sneakily watching anal porn. And I'm a little bit paranoid, so I've got my legs up as I'm watching and kind of, you know, got like the flap for the iPad around. And I'm also so paranoid because the men across from me keep looking at me and the woman next to me is kind of doing like this. And looking at my lap, like there is no way he knows what I'm doing. I am so good at this. I am the queen of surreptitiousness. You know, I've, I've prepared my whole life for this moment. Not really. But even the people in the aisle walking next to me are doing double takes. I'm like, oh my god, what the hell? So I take the earphones out just to make sure that no one else can hear. Particularly around the sphincter, the wetter the better. And it's fine, and no one can hear anything. I'm just like, what the hell? And then I finally follow the guys next to me for days. And you kind of, you know, just the, you know, 
I look down, and finally, finally I realize that the reason why people are actually looking at me is because I'm eating ice cream with chopsticks, like the dumbest white girl who ever had ice cream. <laughs> You know, use the safe, durable, natural resourced wooden chopstick. You know, it's not exciting for everyone, but it gets the job done. People have been doing it for years in certain cultures, and it's fine. You know, chopsticks are fine. Or, you know, I could try to get the ice cream to melt and be a little more creative and end up with brown smears on my body because that's what happens. And that's disgusting. Who has brown smears on your body? It's so fucking gross. <laughs> then, you know, I watch the. Two porn stars, that's um, two porn stars, two porn actors, not a two porn star rating. Um, so, you know, I also narrate their anal expedition, and then if there's such a thing as G rated porn and we lived in an ideal world that existed, this would be G rated anal porn. And it all goes fine, I'm feeling a little comfortable. And I thought, well, maybe it's time to start exploring my colon, not only in grammar, but in masturbation. <laughs> so, baby, if you find unwrapped condoms in the bin, they're mine, okay? And it's just me. Don't freak out. That's what they're from. <laughs> so, you know, I'm getting a little bit hands-on, exploring the backlog of work to do. And then, you know, finally the day comes, and I think, I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready to talk about this. So I thought I'd offer myself up to Mr. Ryder. I offered up, um, I offered my headquarters verbally, not physically, and it just turned around. <laughs> I'm like, okay, you know, maybe it's something you want, we can have butt sex. You know, maybe, I think I'm ready, it might be hard, it might be a bit weird, but you know, we care about each other, and put a lot of thought about this, and you know, if you want it, it's yours, you have the cheeks on the face of the butt. <laughs> And she said, no. <laughs> After all that, no. Um, and he just explained that it almost seemed selfish that it wasn't fair to me or something that he might get more enjoyment out of than me. I said, well, it's fair enough, but I don't have a G-spot in the back of my throat. <laughs> I mean, sometimes I put myself in situations where humiliation is a possibility. Like right now, for example. And so, you know, we talked about it, and I can't believe that amidst all these discussions, his feelings weren't a part of that, you know? I consider myself so third wave, but it's like, oh, fuck, what, he has feelings? Like, our, the women in our lives told us that men just wanted us for sex, that they just want our bodies. It's not true, they want so much more. They don't even lie to us, they don't just want to use us. They want the whole package and it's so stressful. It's like, what? I can't just go, wake up. I almost wish it were true. Like, so simple, men want one thing. It's like, oh, okay, maybe that's just in the top five things. I don't know, maybe your life is in there somewhere too. <laughs> but yeah, so we talked about it and his feelings have to come into it too. Well, so, you know, we're taking it slow, but I guess the other thing is he's kind of confessed he's a bit of a germaphobe, and then he might need to wear gloves or wash his hand five times during. And I was like, okay. So I guess, unless you have a doctor patient fantasy, it's not super erotic. And I mean, completely honest, he might actually need a hazmat suit. <laughs> They're inconvenient, and even in that, you don't need to remember which is your clean hand and which is your devil hand. Like, which hand is going to put me in the hospital, potentially, on antibiotics for at least a month? Like, that's the one I've used. That's everything's happening with this one now. Anyway. Uh, maybe I'm just overthinking this. Maybe it's not that much of a big deal. Maybe we're not really that as special as we think we are. I mean, where does it end? I mean, what, the next guy? Am I going to have to hang myself in a sex dungeon and explode Fifty Shades of Brown? No. I <laughs> like, so are we just creating new virginities for ourselves to make ourselves seem less whorish than we really are and make our bodies seem even more sacred? Like, oh yeah, so, <laughs> I licked the guy's butt while ten guys ejaculated on my feet, but no one's been in my butt. I'm saving that for something special. <laughs> 
special? Does anything really matter? I mean, in the end, what, what are we doing? What are we doing? Where is Paris Hilton anyway? Where did she go? What is the glory hole? I can guess. I don't know. It sounds glorious. Maybe I'll find out for myself one day. Did I inherit my grandmother's anal canal? Is it just like the ultimate poop of my life? <laughs> if I have anal sex, does that mean I can't convert to Christianity later on? Will my health insurance premiums go up? <laughs> there are so many questions, and maybe it's a good thing we're taking it slow because I don't even know if tonguing the chocolate poon is politically correct. <laughs> right, thanks for listening. <laughs>